Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Barry Beckham. This MP4 video has been recorded at full HD resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels. So it should play full screen on Windows PCs, Apple Mac computers, mobile devices and also most modern televisions. This talk was originally put together for my own camera club, but I have decided to record the contents of it. As you can see, the title is The Holy Grail, but I'm suggesting that a secondary title may be one of those statements which I think we all make to ourselves from time to time. If only I knew then what I know now. I accompanied my talk with about 40 or 50 large mounted prints which I've gathered together over the past few years. Unfortunately, I cannot show them here, of course. I'd like to start by going back in time a little bit. In the beginning, we had wet photography, of course. We had dark rooms and glowing red lights. Chemical magic, which we use to darken or lighten our prints. Specialist tanks, lots of temperature control too. Toners and textures to alter a print. Almost sounds like a poem this, doesn't it? Perceptol and Microfan were a couple of potions that I used. I wonder how many remember those names. But it was the days of the black arts of the darkroom, because they were for the few. Back then, most amateur photographers were shooting colour slides. Those that had a darkroom or had the opportunity to black out a room even temporarily, often shot black and white negatives too. So at that time we also had our camera club. This was around the start of the digital revolution, in the very early days. I was having a break from camera club life. I realised looking back that I'd lost a little bit of inspiration in my photography. I'd been a club member for some years, I'd been reasonably successful, I think my name was on most of the trophies in the club at least once, but I was obviously looking for something to inspire me. I did consider for a very short time a career in photography, but it never really appealed to me. I already had a career anyway, and I think this would have just spoilt my hobby, or that was my view at the time, and I think I still hold that view. I did consider chasing letters after my name, which seemed to be popular then and still is today. But I recall I used to mix with lots of people who were associates of the Royal Photographic Society, fellows of the Royal Photographic Society, and I know it sounds a bit of a whinging pom statement, but... They didn't impress me. They didn't impress me technically. They didn't impress me creatively. And it rather took away any appeal to chase letters after my name. But then the guy at the top left of the picture on the left, which I'll explain in a moment, introduced me to Photoshop and I was re-inspired. So I went back to my camera club but found that the words digital or Photoshop were clearly not politically correct. Well, this is the attitude that greeted me. This is certainly how it felt at the time. The camera club members' reaction to those dastardly words, digital and photography, was first to try to ban digital, but that really wasn't very practical, was it? Following on from that, they tried to shove it in a corner out of the way. They wailed and whined that it wouldn't last. They complained that it was just a pretender to the real thing which was film. They moaned and groaned about the quality not being good as 35mm film. But here's a real good one. Your digital images can't come into my film competition. Well, if digital wasn't going to last, if it was a pretender to film, if the quality wasn't as good as 35mm film, where was the problem? Methinks they weren't being entirely honourable back then. And of course, we can always fall back on the old chestnut. 
anyway it's cheating. But in fact, I now realise they were scared to death of digital photography, and they reacted in a pretty typical way. Now back in the day, I didn't have any tolerance for this sort of attitude at all. And I'm not exactly a shrinking violet, and I knew that if I stayed in my camera club, sparks would fly. But here's the irony. So I'd love to go back to some of those people and say, who's the jackass now? So I took my bat and ball and I went to play elsewhere. And that elsewhere was the internet, which, as it's turned out, has been one of the best things I did. I formed a group called iDig, Internet Digital Imaging Group. I didn't intend to. All I was looking for was like-minded people exploring digital photography and Photoshop. And there I am at the top right of this picture. This was the guy I found. He lived at the other end of the UK to me, probably 400 miles between us. So we rarely met, but we did in the end. But we were both interested in the digital revolution and Photoshop. So we ended up teaching one another. What I discovered, I sent to him on an email and vice versa. But pretty soon after that, Dave Chilvers over on the left joined us. Now Dave's an important person to me because he's the one who introduced me to Photoshop in the first instance. And the other guy here is Rob Taylor, one of the very early members of the group. And one picture we don't have is of Catherine McKinty. She created this fun picture for us, as you can see, and she called it The Four Wise Men. I'm not entirely sure about the title, but the picture certainly gave us all a laugh at the time. I think from memory the group grew to about eight or ten strong at its peak. But of course, every night your inbox was bombarded with some fabulous images, with some fabulous techniques, all freely shared amongst the group. One of the group was David Rowley, a name one or two of you listening may have heard of. So there I am, or I should say, there I was, because this picture, as you can see, was taken in 1999, about 18 years ago. I didn't have much hair then, but far less now. The camera I'm holding is the second Nikon Corpix camera that was released. It was a 2 million megapixel sensor, and when you think what we're using today, that was quite small, but it was a fabulous little camera, and I wish they still made this, but if it captured 20 million pixels, I'd go out and buy one tomorrow. The first one they released was the Nikon 900, and that only had 1 million pixels in the sensor, and soon after this, they introduced the Nikon Coolpix, I believe it was the 990 or something like that. And you probably guessed how many pixels it climbed to. 3 million. So I've been an amateur SLR user for 40 plus years now. Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? I've used Photoshop almost as long as it's been around, not quite certainly before digital cameras were available, when the route we used to get our images onto the computer was generally by scanning them either ourselves or via a Kodak CD, which at the time producing 17 megabyte images, I had to think there for a moment, 17 megabyte images was considered about the best you could get at a reasonable price. So my CV, I've written hundreds of step-by-step -step tutorials for UK magazines, and I did this not as a job, purely as an interesting hobby, and it gave me a drive to take pictures and to create them. For many years, Adobe provided me with Photoshop and many of their other software products too. I've demonstrated at clubs all around the UK, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and as technology allowed, we went on to record on-screen videos, such as you're watching now, but obviously very small back in those days. 
and I did help Pictures to Etsy to become better known in the UK. I created a video tutorial on how easy it was to put a slideshow together and I'm going back quite a few years now but because we had a cover disc on the magazine I was able to include not only the video but also the final slideshow which went down particularly well. I started to get requests for my video tutorials and things just grew from there. I now have complete Photoshop and Lightroom video courses and they vary from basic to masterclass. I have contributed to two books and I've written one on Photoshop Elements. That was the original Photoshop Elements. I think we're up to 14 or 15 now. Let's talk photography. We can actually learn quite a bit from the days of film. It's not completely dead as we may first think. So back in the early days of digital, most amateurs were shooting, as I said earlier on, either colour slides and or black and white negatives. Colour negatives weren't used very much by amateur photographers at all. But there was a rule of thumb back then when we were shooting colour slides, and it said that we should expose for the highlights and allow the shadows to take care of themselves. Well, if I move on to a picture which may be typical of what we may see in a darkened club room, a colour slide illuminated by a powerful projector. So you can understand that rule of thumb. Because the important area not to overdo was the highlights. The shadows were going to be lit with a pretty powerful bulb. So those shadows had to be absolutely black before we lost all detail within them. But of course that meant if we overexpose the highlights just a little bit, we could destroy the entire charm of the image we was trying to produce. So back then, exposing for the highlights and allowing the shadows to take care of themselves made perfect sense. And in fact, many of us, if we had a colour slide film with an ASA rating, which is now ISO of course, an ASA rating of 100, we would often expose the film at maybe 125 ASA just to richen up the colours and the highlights because it seemed to work better when projected through a projector. But of course we also used to shoot black and white negatives and the rule of thumb for them was the reverse. Expose for the shadows and allow the highlights to take care of themselves. Now that also made perfect sense and it's still relevant today. Because whether we are working in a dark room 30 or 40 years ago or on a computer today, image editing is easier and a much better quality when we're editing from light pixels to dark pixels and not dark pixels to light. Anyone who works on a computer with images soon discovers that if you try to bring up detail from dark shadows, you introduce all sorts of problems. Here's an unmanipulated raw image straight from my camera, which has been exposed for the shadows, but in fact I haven't allowed the highlights to take care of themselves, but we'll cover that a little bit later in the talk. But you can quite clearly see that I don't have any heavy shadows there at all. So I'm not going to have any difficulty in my image editor with this image. And of course, once we're in this position, we have a degree of scope. There's more versatility within the image that we manipulate. Now, the modern term for exposing for the shadows is called exposing to the right. And what we're looking at here is the histogram from this particular image. And the light tone pixels are represented by the peak of that little mountain on the right hand side. That's where the name comes from. So even in the digital age, it's quite important that we get exposure right. Because the effects of poor exposure are pretty damning. Images lack general appeal, which I think we would all agree, 
the quality suffers. We end up with noise in places we shouldn't have it, artifacts in places we shouldn't have it. Image editing becomes much more difficult and time consuming because we do one thing and we seem to cause two others. The negative effects of image editing then generally are clearly seen in the image and if you're a camera club member and you enter the competitions of course the judges will pick these problems up pretty quickly. Image editing becomes difficult to learn. If you were an amateur carpenter and you wanted to make a nice coffee table for your lounge you wouldn't go down to the wood yard and buy a tatty piece of wood and expect to make quality furniture and yet we seem to want to try to do that at times with our images a bad exposure and we want to create something special well I'm afraid in most cases that's not going to happen so unless you get the exposure better Image editing is very difficult to learn. Sounds a bit weird, but the better the exposure, the easier you're going to learn. Once you've learnt, now you can broaden out the areas of exposure that you can cope with. The photographer also sometimes becomes very frustrated with their photography because it appears to be hit and miss. And they never really get the best from the images they capture. And I've known photographers that always seem to be in a battle with their image editor. Now at this point I'm going to move on and we're going to look at some very early digital images. These would have been shot around 1997, 98, 99, somewhere around that time. Many of these would have been published as part of a step-by-step -step tutorial in Digital Photo magazine or the earlier version of that which was digital photo effects. Hen knife is one. Probably taken with one of those Coolpix cameras, could have even been the one in the photograph we saw previously. And it's a simple composite. As you can see I just took a picture of a half opened pen knife. I used selection skills there to remove the blades to create the headdress and the beak. You may wonder why there's a red tomato there and couldn't I find something else? It may be nice if, the, if, if that subject was something metallic, but pretty simple answer really. I seem to remember this for some reason. I'm not sure why I can remember this so well, but I remember being in the house. The wife was out shopping in the car. I needed something colourful and that was the best I could find at the time and I've never got round to changing it. Our Siamese cat on the wall on the back garden, but of course the sky wasn't there like that. Another composite image. This was something which I enjoyed at the time. I still do it to some degree. I call this digital doodling. I think it was probably more common when we was using cameras with just one, two, three million pixels in the sensor. We did struggle sometimes to capture full photographic quality but it was always better than the moaners would have you believe but here is when you open up an image in your image editor with no set idea of what you're going to do and you just doodle much like you would with a pen or a pencil and sometimes you have got a really good result and although I'm looking back 20 years here or thereabouts I still find something in this picture that I like. Now I think that if you can bring up an image from getting on for 20 years ago and you're still willing to show it, I think that's a pretty good indicator that the image is okay because most of the time the best critic for our own work is ourselves. Now here's an interesting shot where I started to learn how to cut out all sorts of subjects and if you think of a hot air balloon although you cannot see too much detail here the baskets are all held on by thin wires and of course when you're making selections and cutouts you needed to include them and do it in a way that was acceptable well the images this image itself was probably created 20 years ago but the young lad there that's a scanned black and white negative so that image could be 30 plus years and the reason I know that 
is because there he is on the right and he's 41 next birthday. This is another early composite shot. I recall the boat being shot at Portsmouth in the south of England, but I'm pretty certain the captain wasn't shot there, or if he was, it certainly wasn't in front of the boat like that. Now when you were making selections to make images like this, the selections have to be pretty accurate. So it does take a little bit of time. You cannot do anything good and not spend any time on it at all. And of course the trick here is attention to detail and also to make it more realistic by adding that slight softness to the ship. After all, the ship is just a background for the portrait. This is an interesting image in as much as this is one of those that was never published. The magazine editor told me he couldn't publish this because it was too advanced at the time, so at least he played to my ego when he turned me down. But in actual fact it wasn't such a difficult image. If you look very carefully you can see that it's made up basically of a flower. Now I cut out a flower in Photoshop leaving it transparent, so floating on a transparent background. I copied it, flipped it over, and the shape of the alien's eyes almost formed themselves by accident. That triggered the idea for the picture. I found the skin from uh, an iguana, which was a pet of my brother-in-law, so I had a couple of shots of that, so I copied and pasted the skin. And the eyes and the lips come from a portrait shot at one of the camera club's portrait night sessions and the alien was born. Now this is a picture that brings back some good memories. This picture in fact still hangs in my daughter's home in Brisbane. In the early days of digital when I was demonstrating Photoshop some club members were really quite rude and they could not resist telling me at every opportunity they could that digital imaging wasn't going to last, it was poor quality, it was this, it was that. So I contacted the printers and I suggested that I needed a print that would wow people. And I explained the problem I was having. Now I was demonstrating quite a bit back in those days, so the printers suggested that if they could put their logo on the edge of the print, they would do one for me for free, which I thought was very nice of them. So I sent them off a batch of about six different images and I just said, would you print the one that you think is going to print the best? Now in those days, nobody at home even had a 10 by 8 color printer for their photography. But I was hoping as I'm sending this away to a commercial printers to get a 1612, if I was lucky, maybe a 2016 which by digital standards at the time would have been huge. Well, when it was delivered, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was 30 by 20, but of course packed in a huge box, it looked even bigger than that. But I had a bit of a shock when I pulled this image out of the box. Because at the time we were working on monitors like you can see there. 13 inch monitors, in fact that one reminds me of mine, particularly with the speakers either side. So I was shocked because I hadn't appreciated how much quality I had locked in my digital file until I saw it printed 30 by 20. And of course it served me well. I took it to the demonstrations, I kept it hidden away facing the wall, and as soon as I got someone who couldn't resist making some comment, I would pick up the print and remember, this was huge by the standards of the day, walk into the audience and hand it to them and ask them what was wrong with the quality. And from then on, you could hear a pin drop. This digital image is bang up to date, created a couple of years ago. And this one is similar. But I do still think there is a little bit of prejudice against digital with this type of work. That's a personal view. But I think I've learned to be a pretty good judge of what is a reasonable image and what isn't. 
And sometimes when you put images like this in front of a judge in camera clubs, you have to be a bit lucky to get one who's open-minded. Some are still not, sadly, and these will always be marked low. So I can now look back at least 45 years and perhaps pose a question or two. What were my eureka moments in those 45 years? What knowledge did I discover along the way that made a real difference to my photography and elevated it above hit and miss? And going back to my title at the start, one of those statements we all say to ourselves from time to time, if only I knew then what I know now. So what are the eureka moments for me? Well, there's the first one, learning about exposure. The second one is learning about exposure. The third one is learning about exposure. I think you're getting my drift, aren't you? It really is important, even in the digital age. But there is another problem too. Our camera is a pretty dumb machine. It has no idea whether we're about to take a picture of a black cat in a coal cellar or a white cat in the snow. So to overcome some of that hit and miss photography many people suffer from, manual, no, if I can say it, manual exposure really is the key, if not all of the time, certainly for a few months, because what you'll discover is exposure isn't the big mystery you thought it was. If I want to go to a place and I use the satellite navigation in my car to take me there, everything works fine. Two weeks later, when I want to go to the same place again, the odds on chance is I need the sat nav again, because I haven't really paid attention to the route. I drove safely enough, but I didn't pay attention. Now, in the last few weeks, I actually saw something written where a study's been done which proves this, but I think most of us would accept that as common sense. So if we get a camera and we turn it to an automatic setting, it tends to blind us to the knowledge that we're trying to learn. Should we be surprised then that exposure remains the holy grail of photographers even in the digital age? Well, no, of course not. No, 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 well, maybe yes. Why do I say that? Well, because too many people do think that they're super duper, all singing, all dancing cameras can do everything for them, and it can't. And there is also a view, I have the money, so I'm going to pay the money and reap success, if only. And of course, the real humdinger, and don't worry too much about exposure, Photoshop can fix mistakes. If only that were true. Now I suppose we could say that Photoshop is powerful enough to put right some mistakes, but not big ones, and we shouldn't use that to structure our whole photographic approach. And I said here that if only it were true, but I'm not sure we'd want it to be true, because anything easy to achieve, we don't value. There's no reward without some effort. Sorry folks, but we're going to have to learn something. The thing is, learning's fun. When it's coupled with an interest in the subject, and we all have that, we should enjoy the learning, it's not a chore. But if it is a chore for you, you're either doing something wrong and you need to fix that. You do not have to accept a hit and miss approach to your photography. Or perhaps you have chosen the wrong hobby and it's just something you're not prepared to put the effort into. What's this? I wonder how many people instantly recognize this. Well, it's another holy grail of photographers. Now, it's an 18% grey card. Now, I've called it a grey card. That's a slip of the tongue to some degree because it goes back to my film days when I would carry an 18% grey card. It was a sheet of this tone grey, 
glued to a piece of card that sat down the pocket of my camera bag and I could use it whenever I felt it was necessary. But what is it? Is it important to us? Well, yes it is. It's quite important because your camera's exposure is calibrated to this. But it's still a dumb machine. Please forgive this very unelegant picture that I've just put up on screen. On the day I needed to shoot it, as you can see, it was bin day, so not a good choice. But what I did was I chose a day where it was sunny with white fluffy clouds. I set my camera to manual. I set 100 ISO, 250th of a second shutter speed, and F8. I walked outside the street door. I held the camera to my eye. I focused, but didn't use any of the in-camera exposure metering, and I took this shot. Now I hope you'll agree that there's nothing wrong with this exposure at all. It's a raw file, it's untouched, it hasn't been manipulated in any way. How could I guess exposure so effectively without any in-camera metering? Well, it's because exposure to me isn't such a mystery because I've worked with a manual camera quite some time. I understand how my camera's exposure meter is calibrated and here we are back to the 18% grey and of course I have used manual exposure for quite some time and it's taught me that exposure is often quite predictable. Now a grey card was one of my eureka moments and the little aeroplane there is a prompt for me to tell you a little story. Back in the days when I was shooting film, living in the UK, I would visit one of the many air shows that were available through the southeast of England, and good they were too. But what I couldn't quite work out, some of the shots that I took of the aircraft in flight came out perfectly well while others were almost in silhouette and I could not fathom what the problem was. It was a camera club colleague I think, I can't recall exactly who it was but I'm going to assume it was a camera club colleague who said to me what you need is a grey card. Just put the grey card on the ground, take a meter reading from the grey card, fill, it, fill the frame with the card and then just put the camera on manual and use that setting. And it worked. Now it worked because when the plane flies over the blue sky, that's very close to the 18% grey, so exposure's good. When the plane flies over the white cloud, the camera says, wow, it's bright, and it gives me less exposure. It's as simple as that. I'm almost embarrassed to admit such a fundamental mistake. But all it was back at that time was a lack of learning. It was just something that I hadn't learned yet. Now if I just run that animation again and we think about what's happening, it's all rather logical, isn't it? Exposure here is fine, but when the plane flies over the white cloud, the camera sees a subject which is overly bright and wants to adjust the exposure. But as soon as the plane flies out from the side or over the cloud into the blue sky, the exposure is now good again. So that was a bit of a moment for me. And you couldn't fail to hear that because that was one of my pennies dropping. And I carried a grey card in the side pocket of my camera bag for years after this. And it's why I can't stop referring it to a card because that's how I recall it. When we think about how our camera reads light it makes sense of this. It reads light reflected from the subject but there is another way we can record light falling onto the subject. It's called an incident light meter reading and you may have seen this maybe with a wedding photographer. They've got a group of people, we've got bride and bridesmaids in light or white dresses, we've got the groom and the rest of the guys in dark suits. If we took a shot 
with the SLR in the normal way. The dark suits or the light dresses can overly impact the exposure. By reading the light falling onto the subject, we overcome that. Then the wedding photographer gets the best exposure he can, or she can, for the dark suits and the light dresses. So carrying a physical grey card can help us do much the same thing. But of course we don't have to carry the card, we can use what's around us. Because if you look around at the concrete you're standing on when you're taking some shots you take, you'll probably find it's very, very close to 18% grey. Certainly close enough to take a good meter reading from. Thank you for watching and I hope the video was helpful in some way. Don't forget that I do produce a monthly newsletter and that also contains at least one video on a photographic subject. And we also have a dedicated photo forum at www.beckhamforum.com.au. Why not come along and join us?